Hi, thanks for tuning into Singularity Prosperity. In this video, we'll be discussing big data. More specifically, what big data is, the exponential rate of growth of data, how we can utilize these vast quantities of data being generated, as well as the implications of linked data on big data. Data has been an essential part of human evolution for thousands of years. We as a species are pattern solvers by default and use data as a tool. In other words, we gather information of our surroundings to optimize our lives. The earliest humans passed on information just through word of mouth, but as our brains developed, we began to record this information. The first examples of this data preservation come from over 35,000 years ago with cave paintings. This was the hunter-gatherer age, so it makes sense that most of the paintings were of animals, a way to pass down knowledge of the types of animals to hunt and the weapons used. Rather than a long game of broken telephone, recording information was a much more efficient way to pass down information, and allowed us to do three important things that life was unable to do before. 1. Expand knowledge rapidly. 2. Preserve the knowledge gained over generations. 3. Build on past knowledge to gain deeper insights. This accumulation of knowledge continued for thousands of years as our ancestors started to become more advanced and develop more powerful tools and survival instincts. Around 3,000 to 5,000 years ago, we reach another milestone in human data collection, whereas previously only information that correlated with our survival was obtained and transferred, at this point, all across the world and various civilizations, history and stories began to be recorded more frequently, primarily due to the fact that we began to become better at communicating ideas and expressing our thoughts, as spoken and more importantly written languages became more sophisticated. Fast forward to the year 300 and we arrive at the Great Library of Alexandria. Rarely before or since has a government allocated so much of its gross national product for the acquisition of knowledge. Every ship entering its harbor was searched, not for treasure, but for books that could be copied and stored there. Estimates on the number of scrolls contained in the library before it was destroyed range from half a million up to one million, and they contain many of the core pillars of mathematics, science, geography, philosophy, and more from some of the greatest human minds in history, such as Euclid, Pythagoras, and Socrates to list a few. Derived from the knowledge in the scrolls came astounding conclusions, from how to calculate the mass of the earth to mathematical formulas that we still use today to map out the universe and everything in between. Alexandria contained unbounded wisdom and knowledge. The Great Library of Alexandria demonstrated the importance of the accumulation of vast amounts of information and how deciphering the information could produce meaningful results that further contribute to our ability to solve problems. Other examples of datasets over the years that have opened our eyes to the world around us include The astronomical dataset really began to take off in the 1500s with Nicholas Copernicus, Galileo, and Johannes Kepler. By using years of previous data on the movement of celestial bodies obtained by Greek astronomer Ptolemy in the year 100, and by tracking the motion of the planets over the course of years, their combined contributions were able to derive that instead of celestial bodies orbiting Earth how many thought, it was in fact Earth and the planets that orbited the Sun. The microscopic realm was opened to our eyes in the mid-1600s with Anton van Leeuwenhoek and Robert Hooke. Through the use of the first microscopes, we were finally able to see and make observations past the macroscopic, and bacteria, cells, and even microscopic life were observed. Without the microscopic data set, we wouldn't have modern medicine and the majority of technologies we see today. Past the microscopic, the quantum data set began to be added to starting in the 1900s from the theories of great minds such as Einstein, Max Planck, Niels Bohr, Ernest Rutherford, and many others. The ability to interact with individual atoms through the use of the tunneling electron microscope is behind the significant advances in technology today, allowing us to fit more smaller transistors on ships. This data set is still in its infancy, giving birth to new jobs such as nanoengineering, and there is still so much to explore, which we'll discuss in future videos. These data sets are just a small subset of all the knowledge acquired in the last 2,000 years, and all the information since the cave paintings but a small blip compared to the information currently at our fingertips, our own personal libraries of Alexandria. 1990 corresponds with the birth of the World Wide Web and the start of the information age, a data revolution. In 1986, approximately 2.6 exabytes of data existed. By 1993, in the span of 7 years, and 3 years after the web went public, that number increased over 6 times to 15.8 exabytes. For a visual representation, before we move on, an exabyte is 1 billion gigabytes, and a zettabyte is 1000 exabytes. The real before big data after big data moment came in the mid-90s with the creation of search, a way to sift through the already vast amounts of data on the young web. Another 7 years from 1993 and 2000, as search engines matured and web 1.0 started to go mainstream, the amount of data nearly quadrupled to 55 exabytes, and 7 years from 2000 and 2007, the rate of growth increased to 6 times again, with the total data in existence growing to 300 exabytes. 
Information added to the web up to this point was primarily just digitizing all human knowledge, written, spoken, and experiential. However, 2007 was a pivotal turning point for big data, as sensor data began to populate more space on the web, and Web 2.0 started to go mainstream. The iPhone, not surprisingly, was released in 2007, packed with sensors, such as the accelerometer, gyroscope, and more, and started the transformation to our now digitized mobile world. In less than 7 years since 2007, by 2013 the rate of growth of data had increased over 15 times with 4500 exabytes or 4.5 zettabytes of data produced, with total data officially passing the zettabyte mark sometime in 2009 or 2010. The worldwide adoption of mobile phones has sparked an exponential explosion in data creation and has been the catalyst for the field of big data to evolve. Beyond just mobile phones, internet-connected devices are evolving into a field of their own with the Internet of Things, which in turn correlates to the increasing number of sensors that can digitize the physical world into data even further. For example, over the past few years, a big trend in big data we've all seen is the health community, with the digitizing and tracking of ourselves through the use of smartwatches and other health tracking devices. We have over 6 billion data points sitting in our genomes alone. On top of this, if you've watched my global connectivity series, there are countless initiatives to bring the rest of the world online to the internet, with right now approximately 48% connected. As this number of users connected increases, the rate of growth of this exponential data production will continue to increase as well. In fact, as seen in this picture, Picture, we are currently at an inflection point between current big data markets and emerging markets. Onwards from 2017, emerging markets will begin to produce larger and larger portions of the data the world produces. By 2020, conservative estimates pin total data production at 44 zettabytes, and by 2025, at 200 zettabytes. As seen in this exponential graph of data production over the years, we are primed to reach the yottabyte era by 2030. As reference, 1 yottabyte is equal to 1000 zettabytes. As an interesting note, beyond yottabyte, nothing officially exists yet, although the tech industry is leaning towards brontobyte to represent 1000 yottabytes, and geobytes to represent 1000 brontobytes. Another interesting trend in itself to look at is the increase in data produced per day, from less than a 40th of an exabyte in 2002 to 3 exabytes in 2013, and now we are on pace to reach 5 exabytes per day in 2018. At this rate of growth, we'll be producing nearly 120 exabytes of data per day by 2025. To put these numbers in perspective, in 2013, 90% of all data we as a human race had ever accumulated was produced between 2010 to 2013. At our current rate of growth, in 2020, the same quantity of data produced up until 2013 will have been created in just that year alone. Our data production is on an accelerating exponential trend with no end in sight. So what is big data you ask? It is simply large sets of data. For a better understanding of big data, let's look at the three Vs, its core pillars, volume, variety, and velocity. We looked at volume in the previous section with how much big data is being produced and the rate of growth of data generation. Variety in big data means having either structured or unstructured data. Structured data is a tool we've been optimizing since the birth of the web, data that is organized in tables within databases and mostly easily understandable. However, the vast majority of data on the web is unstructured and constantly morphing, expanding, and evolving. Most unstructured data to us at this point is essentially static noise, but this is beginning to rapidly change as we'll later explore. The real power of big data is being able to sift through various data sets, both structured and unstructured, understand them, and derive correlations and conclusions from them. You can consider big data to be the microscope we use to peer deeper into the world around us. For example, let's take a look at the astronomical data set we talked about earlier. All that data on the motion of the planets by itself would have been useless, but the conclusion derived from it that we and all the other planets orbit the sun validated the data set. First the data had to be accumulated, then a conclusion in the data set drawn, and finally the conclusion had to be verified by gathering more data and other astronomers verifying it as well. Verifying the conclusions and correlations drawn for big data as accurate representations of the world is the hard part. Depending on how you view data, you will draw different correlations from it. Not all of them are correct or have real world applications. As discussed in the previous section, with sensors almost everything is quantifiable, from the liquidity in the soil, to radiation in the atmosphere, to the heartbeat and breathing of a newborn. Yet even now, much of our world remains to be digitized, from mapping of the human body on a cellular level, to better understanding the genome, to in-depth mapping of the oceans. The list can go on and on. The increasing number of internet-connected devices due to mainstream adoption, smart cities and more will help with this digitization. Individually, these products are great and help contribute to our own personal well-being and life, but the real power is when hundreds of millions of people contribute data and we can begin to see patterns emerge from across the world. However, at this point data generation or volume isn't our issue anymore. It is understanding the variety in data and data sets and being able to utilize them by deriving verifiable conclusions and correlations that have practical real-world applications. When working with structured data, 
Languages such as SQL have been around for nearly two decades to assist in recognizing patterns in datasets. As big data volume has grown, additional data frameworks such as Hadoop have been introduced. For a simplistic example of a structured database, let's take a look at something an e-commerce website, let's say Amazon, would use. Let's imagine a structured database with the columns gender of users, categories of products bought, and rating given to the purchased product. By analyzing the data, they could derive what categories each gender favors based on rating given to the products they have purchased in those categories. To validate their findings, these results would be plotted over years, and by doing so, even more patterns would be observed, like the categories changing with the seasons and the same repetition year after year. If only life was as simple as our example, Working with structured data when it comes to transactions is typically fairly simple. The real difficulty arrives when working with multiple sensors or other ambiguous data sets. Even more convoluted is unstructured data. Most of the data on the web is unstructured and correlations cannot be easily seen or derived. Some examples of unstructured data include photos, videos, social media data, satellite images, scientific data, and more. These data types and sets are extremely difficult to convert into actionable insights. To derive any conclusion from unstructured data is a long, manual, painstakingly difficult process. Also, there is a major shortage of skills in analyzing unstructured data. Not to mention that working with structured data can be just as difficult. As humans, we can only see patterns at such a deep level before things stop making sense to us. With the increasing popularity of machine learning, this is starting to rapidly change as we'll explore in our upcoming AI video series. As stated earlier, big data acts as more of a microscope, allowing us to peer deeper into the world and draw correlations and conclusions from the patterns we see through the use of powerful algorithms and machine learning. The role of data scientists is to to be able to derive these conclusions by taking data from various sources and deciphering them by shifting and transforming the data to understand it. In other words, to recontextualize the data and put it in formats we can perceive, think, and talk about, and then taking action on them. Machines can derive the actionable insights, but it's up to us to actually take action on them. The role of data engineers is to get data into a structured or usable format, whether from sensors or converting the unstructured data constantly being added to the web. It is to be noted that new types of data are constantly being uploaded to the web, further increasing the complexity of unstructured data. Also to be noted is the fact that data engineers and scientists were jobs that did not exist not too long ago, further exemplifying how fast this field is growing. The percentage of data on the web that was in a usable analytical format in 2013 was at 22%. By 2020, this is expected to reach 37%. What this means is that most data on the web is simply unusable, but through the efforts of data engineers, this is beginning to change. We can also help identify data through the use of tags, hashtags, and metadata such as video descriptions and transcriptions, allowing the data to be more understandable for us and computers for big data analytics. What many of the statistics mentioned in this video don't take into consideration is a huge paradigm shift data is currently undergoing. Linked data. When we transition from spoken to written language and then to digital, each time a revolution was needed in the way we communicate to further advance our species and technology. Linked data does this once again for us and our devices. The next step in the data revolution. If you watched my video on the evolution of the web, you'll know that linked data is critical for Web 3.0, the semantic web, and actually giving context and meaning to all the information we see. Linked data is also critical for laying the groundwork for future technologies to come with Web 4.0. So, what is linked data and what does it fix? Linked data is simply a way of structuring data, so when you're ready you can easily share it with the world, and aims to solve the data isolation and hoarding issue, as well as reduce the data clutter on the web. Let me explain. If you publish a document, say an Excel file on the web, that is a fine way to get your information out if the purpose is just for reading, say in a blog. However, the data behind such a document is locked away and inaccessible to the public. If a change is made to the data in the document, that previous post and all other posts that relate to the previous data set are essentially rendered useless, thereby increasing useless data clutter on the web. Linked data is about applying the core principles of the web, sharing information on a much deeper level than just presenting the information. Linked data gives each entity on the web its own uniform resource identifier, URI, just like the URI, aka URL, given to websites. This will dramatically change the way information is shared and stored on the web. For example, say there is a post on a scientific journal discussing the correlation between atmospheric conditions and the growth of tomatoes, with data obtained through atmospheric sensors over the past two years. Without linked data, while the article would be useful in assisting farmers and gardeners to grow better quality tomatoes, the data would only be viewable, not interactable. Also, the atmospheric data set would have to be continually updated through new articles as more data was obtained and new correlations derived, further increasing data clutter on the web. With linked data, the latest captured sensor data could be continuously updated to the article and bring deeper 
brand sites into the best conditions for tomato growth. Also, other farmers and gardeners could begin to post their own articles on the growth of other crops with additional information such as soil moisture and more, all linking back to the original data set. So instead of the article just being a static webpage showing the best atmospheric conditions to grow tomatoes based on past data, this simple article now evolves into a platform of its own, becoming a guide to growing various crops based off atmospheric, soil saturation, and other conditions. As more people come to this hypothetical platform, it would continually evolve and because of the structure of linked data, big data scientists or machine learning algorithms could go through the data and begin to find correlations that weren't previously known. This video clip should provide a better representation of the power of linked data. An app developer has an idea. She uses the City Council's open dataset to find every drop curb location in the city and creates a route finder app specifically for wheelchair users. The Council learned about the app and felt inspired to commission a website that visualizes data on upcoming roadways, helping commuters to plan their travel. The web developer is big into nature, so in his spare time, he creates a similar website using an open dataset from a natural conservation charity. His impressive site picks up a ton of shares on social media, earning the charity a free boost in exposure and donations, which they use to fund a new dataset which quickly gets linked to a university dataset that's being studied by a team of researchers. The links reveal new patterns in their data, leading to a game-changing new discovery. With linked open data, a whole new world of opportunity is at our fingertips. An example of simplistic linked data we can see in our everyday lives already is the increasing complexity of Google search. When searching for a movie, for example, Google will pull information from IMDb, Rotten Tomatoes, Wikipedia, YouTube, and other trusted sites, as well as even display show times from your local theater. Along with reducing data clutter, since data updated in one location can be updated across all locations it is linked to, linked data will also reduce data hoarding and isolation. Much of the data on the web is stored in what many like to call data vaults or silos. While sometimes these are necessary for protecting sensitive information, often useful information is stored away as well due to the vast volumes of data some companies generate. Also, due to internal office politics, regulatory, and a variety of other reasons, often data between departments in the same company will even be isolated from each other. One person's useless data is another person's key to success. As linked data becomes more prevalent, information stored away in these silos can begin to be unlocked and networked together, so more insightful correlations between various sets of data can be drawn. Linked data will not only be critical for the transfer of human knowledge, but a way for machines to efficiently communicate with each other as well. For example, say a sensor in your backyard shows the soil is dry, and the sensors the weather network are using are predicting rainfall. Instead of wasting water in your garden, your home personal assistant will tell you not to water the plants because of a thunderstorm later, as the two sensors were able to seamlessly and efficiently communicate between each other. This machine readability linked data is oriented around is a key feature for big data analytics, providing a structured format for data added to the web, and a way to convert current data on the web into a structured format. This added structure will allow for machine learning algorithms and big data scientists to better navigate through the data and use more of the data available on the web. The information on the web will begin to communicate amongst itself and even draw conclusions from itself like a living organism. Linked data sets are beginning to grow exponentially. From none in 2006, 30 in 2007, 300 in 2011, and so far 1,150 this year. At this exponential rate of growth, we'll hit 5,000 by 2020 and 25,000 by 2025. These numbers may appear small, but each data dataset can have anywhere from tens, hundreds, thousands, or even millions of entries. For example, DBpedia has over 4.5 million. Not all data added to the web has to be uploaded in a linked format, and it is nearly impossible that it ever will. However, it is critical that we get the most important pieces of data linked together, such as medical research, traffic maps, environmental data, and other very important data sets. As time progresses, as with any technology, exponential adoption will bring change faster than many expect. Linked data will open up a new era of innovation, paving the path for future technologies and better utilization of current technology and data. Blockchain is aimed to radically transform linked data as well, but that is a topic best left for another video. The third V of big data is velocity. While earlier in this video we looked at one aspect of velocity, the rate of growth of the volume of big data, velocity also means the rate of analysis of big data. In today's growing mobile society, people demand real-time results. I'm sure many of you have experienced frustrations when a web page takes longer than a few milliseconds to load. Linked data assists in increasing the velocity of data processing, since as discussed earlier, changes made to data in one location will be propagated across the entire network. Unfortunately, it's not always as simple as a change to an existing analyzed data set. With the size and 
complexity of big data sets yet to be analyzed, even a supercomputer would take days, months, or even years to derive any conclusions from data, let alone deliver it real-time to devices across the world. As we'll explore in the next video in this digital infrastructure series, cloud computing will play a pivotal role in big data analytics, allowing everyone to access big data insights from individuals, companies, and startups in real time. Also, in the next few videos in our big data series, we'll explore some of the use cases of big data, as well as the issues it poses to society. At this point, the video has come to a conclusion. I'd like to thank you for taking the time to watch it. If you enjoyed it, please leave a thumbs up, and if you want me to elaborate on any of the topics discussed, or have any topic suggestions, please leave them in the comments below. Consider subscribing to my channel for more content, follow my Medium publication for accompanying blogs, and like my Facebook page for more bite-sized chunks of content. This has been Encore, you've been watching Singularity Prosperity, and I'll see you again soon.